Now, a different story. It's, it's very easy to make statements about Israel and Palestine and take one side without question. It doesn't actually do much good. It polarizes and it inflames and it slides partisans back into their exclusive bunkers, doesn't it? I am far from naive. I'm not being saccharine here, and I'm well aware of the bitter dangers of Islamic radicalism. But there is a bigger picture. So let's imagine Moshe and Hussein, both 15 years old in 1948. Moshe, well, he was born in Poland, his family having moved to their village from Russia in the 1890s when thousands of Jews were slaughtered in pogroms. He had known anti-Semitism all of his young life, but his parents always said, where else do we go? The Jews of Europe had been expelled from one country after another, always persecuted, often slaughtered. Even when they thought they were accepted, such as in modern France, they suddenly discovered they were hated. But life was not so bad in Poland for Jews if they kept to themselves and they were careful. Until angry, dark, uniformed men arrived, shouting a harsh language and shooting and smashing and killing. Moshe's friends and some of his cousins, they disappeared. But Catholic friends of his father smuggled them east and they managed somehow to survive the war. When they returned to their village in 1946, however, they were beaten, threatened, spat at and they had to leave again. There is a place, explained Moshe's father. There is a reborn country of our people where we can be men, be human, stand tall, and not live in fear. They eventually sailed for Palestine and settled in a town where 1,700 years earlier, their ancestors had flourished. Hussein had never ventured beyond his small village in Palestine and would listen to his father speaking of his adventures when he fought against the Turks, those brutal colonizers of the Arab world. Hussein didn't think of countries as such, but of his family and his clan. He was a Muslim, but his parents weren't very religious. He knew some Christians who would tease him that they were the, the real originals, the locals who had lived there for 1,700 years. But why, he would ask himself, are they called Greek Orthodox? And where's Greece anyway? They were Jews too. When he was a little boy, they, they had been a few, but now there were more. His father said they were welcome as long as their numbers didn't increase. This, after all, was Palestine. And the British were there too. They were okay, but Hussein knew they, they didn't belong. And suddenly, they were gone. Then there was silence, and then a noise greater than anything he had heard before. War. His family fled. He saw dead Arabs and dead Jews in the fields. He heard hatred and screaming. He may even have seen Moshe, also terrified and confused. Moshe and his family wanted not empire or power, but simply acceptance and safety. More than 60 years later, and the grandchildren of Hussein and Moshe are still terrified and still confused. Neither group is evil. Both have a moral case and cause, and neither is being treated fairly. Pray to God for the eyes and the ears of children. This administration has worked in painstaking fashion uh, with the Israelis. In fact, Secretary Kerry was on the phone with Prime Minister Netanyahu this morning already uh, to talk about uh, next steps here. Uh, but we remain very concerned uh, about these reports uh, of a rather barbaric violation of a humanitarian ceasefire agreement. Mm. An Israeli soldier has been kidnapped and he's related, I think, third cousin to the country's defense minister. Israel has promised to level Gaza, or someone has, in the Israeli establishment, but what does that actually mean? Jonathan Har Levy, an expert, joins us to discuss this kidnapping. In a way, it was inevitable, I suppose. Oh, Hamas violated the ceasefire, and he took advantage of uh, Israeli uh, um, adherence to the ceasefire, and that's it. That's the results that were clear. Hamas wanted an achievement in this uh, struggle. So he wanted to take hostages, he wanted to, take, to take kidnap soldiers and live soldiers in order to uh, trade off, to make trade off for the Palestinian terrorists who are in Israeli jail. Mm -hmm. They claim, of course, that uh, it wasn't them. No, uh, uh, I, uh, I uh, monitored the uh, um, uh, Twitter and I, in the morning, you know, they announced it that uh, they uh, captured uh, the Israeli soldier. Later, they changed the version of events, and the reason is very simple. First of all, to avoid the international pressure, and I think there is another reason for that. I think that the soldier is not in a safe place. 
And Israel right now attacking the area of Rafa, and they want to let yeah. it in the fog of battle, and in order not to give any information for free for the Israelis. Mm. I hate to sound pessimistic, but surely, even if the Israelis do get close to him, mm -hmm. he'll be killed. He, of course, may be killed. You know, they wouldn't let him uh, 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 free to the Israelis. And they did it in other cases in the past. Yeah. Um, I think that now the effort of the Israeli effort is focused on Rafah in order to close the area and try to get close to the soldier. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a huge issue. Um, it's also a paradox because it may uh, help Hamas to reach a ceasefire because they got what they wanted. In this case, it may, not in the uh, near future, but in the next, maybe next week, or next, next two weeks. Mm -hmm. And as I see it the, uh, right now, the strategy of Hamas is they are, uh, may be willing to, uh, to reach uh, as, um, a ceasefire in, some, in several terms that, uh, that may be okay with them. And they want to start the Third Intifada in the West Bank, which means we have achievement in Gaza. Uh, in the battlefield and, you know, uh, enduring the Israeli offensive. And we start a new offensive in the West Bank, which is not related for, in their eyes to the situation in Gaza. Let's talk about that, because, because however grotesque this situation is, mm -hmm. it's not going to mean the end of any conflict or the solution or the victory of, of, of either side. Mm -hmm. What happens in the West Bank is very important here. Mm -hmm. Now, it could never be Gaza. It's a different people, a different culture, a different framework, but there could be an uprising that would occupy many Israeli military, police and security, take up a lot of time and cost a lot of money. Yes, but for Hamas, this is an opportunity in order, the uprising, to use the uprising in order to overthrow Fatah uh, uh, rule in the West Bank. Is that likely? The support of Hamas is overwhelming in the West Bank, and not only of Hamas, but the radical Islamists like Hezbollah Tahrir, Islamic Jihad, etc. For example, in the area of Hebron, in the rural area of Hebron, in Jerusalem, you'll find a lot of supporters of Hezbollah Tahrir. And also, by the way, it's a new, you can see presence of uh, ISIS. Uh -huh. So you see the influence of ISIS coming into the West Bank. And that is, for Israel, is uh, very... Uh, it's but hold on, I mean, I, I've, I've never been to Gaza. I've mm -hmm. certainly been to the West Bank. There, there is a strong secular culture. There is still a, a Christian culture that is... Mm -hmm. it, it's not thriving, but it's certainly mm -hmm. very visible. There are people with more of a, of, of a Marxist narrative. Mm -hmm. They're not going to accept Hamas. You know, if you're, you're talking about the Marxist narrative, look, uh, for example, uh, the Marxist movement of PFLP, Palestinian Front for the Liber mm -hmm. Liberation of Palestine. If you looked at the, the suicide bombers of the PFLP during the Second Intifada, they used the Islamic terms justifying their actions. Mm. You see the infiltration of the Islamic discourse into Fatah, into Islam, the, the Marxists, etc. The, Islam, the Islamic uh, uh, tradition, the belief is very strong in the West Bank. The area, this southern area of the West Bank is controlled by, is um, dominated by the Islamists. Mm -hmm. Also in, in the area of Nablus, the area of Jenin. In Ramallah, that's right. There are, there are yeah, more, um, they call it secular, but it's not... Uh, but Ramallah is very important. I mean, surely you can't control the West Bank if you don't have Ramallah. I think that uh, you can control the West Bank. Really? But yes, of course, because the, the major areas are Hebron, Bethlehem, there's a small minor, uh, Christian minority in Bethlehem, and Jenin and, and Nablus. There's a very large area. You really think so? Bethlehem, r right next to the wall, right next to Israel, with, with still a, a strong uh, Christian presence there. You think that could be Hamas territory? The, uh, I, um, uh, from my experience, you know, the, during the time that I served in the Israeli intelligence as an analyst, yeah. uh, we could see the, uh, uh, the movement of uh, uh, Palestinians, of Islamists, from Hebron to the area yeah. of Bethlehem and the pushing out the Christians. Now, the areas of Betzahro and the city of uh, Bethlehem, you can see that the uh, Christian population is being dwindled. Oh, well, of course, there's no doubt yeah. of that. I mean, yes. many have left, many go to Latin America and other places, mm -hmm. which is, I've heard Spanish being spoken in these areas, which is very strange. All of this, what are we to conclude? So even if Israel, and it will continue to win militarily, but it continues to win, but in the long term then, it's surrounded by, by a, an Islamic ideology that doesn't want peace or coexistence, it, it wants victory. What's the long term? The long term is, uh, I think that we can see it now. It's the, another phase of the war of independence for Israel. And the next target for ISIS is Jordan, as we all know. 
they declared it, Saudi Arabia and Jordan. So if Jordan fall into the hands of ISIS, and it's is that going to be a game changer? Okay, but uh, Saudi Arabia would not allow Jordan to, to fall to these people, surely? Look at the data, at the inf what we have right now, okay? The number of jihadists who, come, who uh, came from Jordan to Syria yeah. is one of the largest. From Jordan, from Libya, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Jordan is a big, I think hundreds of Jordanians. So you have a very strong base in Jordan. Mm. Uh, Musa al Zarqabi, if you remember him, from Iraq. Are they Palestinian? He, Palestinians in the refugee camps of... Uh, in, in me, for, for those who are unaware, I mean, Jordan is majority Palestinian. Mm -hmm. uh, Bedouin, who are more loyal to the real family, and, and they've been quite draconian in their control of their Palestinians in, in Jordan, often far fiercer than the Israelis have been. Uh, but, of course, we don't expect left-wing people to understand that. That would be one hell of a conflict if there was an attempt by fundamentalists to take over Jordan. I think that it's real danger. Uh, because ISIS focusing on Jordan and there is a strong presence of Islamists in Jordan and specifically in the cities of Amman and Zarqa. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, they can change the whole um, rule of the games in, 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 the, in the area. And if Jordan becomes ISIS, you know, uh, another uh, affiliate of ISIS, that's a real danger to, to Israel. I, I I can't pretend any of this makes me in any way optimistic. I, I, I really, I'm, I try to be a realist. I, I also try to be generous thinking of the future. But uh, when I think of, 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 of the relative powers involved, Turkey and Iran and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Israel right there, it just seems to me that it's going to be extremely bloody for everybody concerned. But we shall see. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.